right. This is going to be the biggest job program in American history. We're going to end up better paid, cheaper energy, healthier, and more just. And we have to do it. So let's do it in a really good way. I can do that. I told you I love to answer questions. Do we have, um, do we have somebody bringing around a mic runner? So go ahead, let's start. I want to roll back all the giveaways to rich people and big corporations that the Republicans have done, not just under Mr. Trump, but for years. It's completely insane. I am for a wealth tax and have been for a wealth tax for a year and a half. I was one of the first people to propose it because not only is the income incredibly unfair and unequal and unjust, but we have redistributed the wealth in this country to the richest people from everybody else, and that is really unfair, unjust, and un-American. So I start with un rolling back the giveaways to rich people and corporations on income tax. I put in a wealth tax, and then I would treat, I would close all the investment tax loopholes, and just by doing that, by treating investment income like earned income like you get for going to work in the morning, I could give a 10% tax reduction to 95% of Americans. So, Maria, let me talk about how I think about education and how all of this will fit in. So, one of the reasons that I think Mr. Trump is such a fake is I don't think he understands actually what creates a prosperous, productive country. You know, he thinks that the way to create a successful economy is to cut taxes for rich people and corporations, even if 95% of the people don't share in that. That is not success. A growing economy where all the money goes to the richest people is not a success. A banana republic is not what the United States was designed to be. The, exactly. What, what's your name, ma'am? Heidi just said, there's no such thing as a rich country full of poor people. <laughs> Ain't that true? That's a great point, thank you. And so, what actually creates a successful, prosperous country is investing in the people of the country to be successful. And what does that look like? That means when you think about education, it's not a cost to be minimized, which is the way the Republicans think about it. They always cut taxes, and then they cut education spending. K through 12, and higher ed. That is incredibly stupid if you want to have a prosperous, successful country. So that's why, look, my mom was a teacher, but my brother, who's one year older than me, has always been, his career is being an advocate for at-risk kids. And he has spent years telling me, if you don't help the kids by the time they're three, it may be too late. And if you don't do it by five, it's definitely too late. So Maria, when I think about education, I think about it as this is the best possible investment we can make in the future of American people and the future of the American country. And so that's why I'm for absolutely universal pre-K. But more than that, we have to understand this isn't just about success. It's also about justice. Because we pay for K through eight and K through 12 with local real estate taxes. So if you're from a poor community, you have low local real estate taxes. And you're from a rich community, you have a high, so rich kids get more money for their education. So when we think about, it's not just success of the country, it's justice. We don't spend nearly enough equalizing those numbers for kids from low income communities. And what does that mean? That means we're legislating inequality for the next generation. And you can't think about this without talking about race and ethnicity. And you can't think about this from the standpoint of the United States, a prosperous country, without thinking our success is dependent on those young kids, our justice is dependent on investing in all of them fairly, and if there's no mobility in this society, no ability for kids to raise themselves up, whatever, that's the American dream. Every kid gets a chance. 
he or she can go as far as their ambition and talent and hard work will take them. Oh, really? Because I was down in Atlanta, and they were telling me, in Georgia, of kids who grew up in the bottom quintile, so that's just a fancy name for the bottom one-fifth. How many kids get a start there, move out of that bottom one-fifth? One out of 20. That means there's no mobility in this society. There is no correlation between talent of kids where you're born and income level. That means we're incredibly unfair and unjust. So when I think about education, Maria, I start with the idea, we're not spending nearly enough on education. We're not supporting teachers nearly enough as the stewards of the future. I'm a huge believer in empowering teachers to succeed in the classroom. Look, we spent over $700 billion a year on defense. It went up 20% last year. Remember, Mr. Trump going, I may have cheated my way out of the Vietnam War, but now I'm gonna pay it back by raising defense budget. We spend $70 billion total on education at the federal level. It's more than 10 to one defense versus education. Think about that, that's amazing. Now, when it comes to, the, but Maria's question actually was, what about when you get higher up? It's true, we are gonna have a lot of jobs that may go unfilled if kids aren't educated enough, skilled labor jobs. And we have to do a lot of work with unions, for instance, and in high schools and community colleges, which I love, so that kids can be trained and work and go into high-skilled, high-paid, jobs, specifically union jobs around this country. And yes, Maria, I completely love that. In California, which I know the best because that's where I'm from, we have a community college system with 2.2 million kids there right now doing just that kind of work or getting ready to go to a four-year school. So I love all those programs, and I've talked to unions about how they do it and how they bring kids who have been in trouble back into the workforce for good-paying union jobs, and I support every one of those deeply. And the last question is, I mean, the first question I have is, did he go to Trump University when it folded? <laughs> I mean, these are scams. I mean, the real question is, who took the money? I mean, he's a crook. And these, are, these institutions are actually designed to milk the US taxpayer, not to provide education for kids. I have, a, you know, I believe college should be affordable for everybody. I believe in two years of free college, the way you have it in California. I believe in a 1% interest on loans so that you can pay it back one time, not two or three times with a high interest rate. I believe in forgiving the loans if you go to work in any kind of community or country supporting job. But there's no doubt in this country that there is a move by this government and by Republicans to allow corporations to pollute poison and kill people so that they can make more money. And so I promise you, I don't believe anyone, look, I mean, it's sort of funny. If someone gets paid money to shoot you, they put him in jail for murder. But if someone gets paid money to poison you indiscriminately, it's kind of like, okay, I guess that works. Yeah, so in answer to this question, I don't know enough but I do know that in this country, there are plenty of companies who are dumping poisons into the water and air indiscriminately, and the government is saying, it's fine if it makes you more profitable. I, I will go try and check this, Mike. I don't know enough about it, but I am not, I believe that we have an administration that believes, look, they're den science deniers, but they also are here to serve corporations, not people. And under those circumstances, it makes sense to say to a corporation, okay, fine, if you have to poison people, so be it. And we can't have that. Look, it's time for it. It isn't like we need to meet in the middle. We need to win. We can't compromise with people who are poisoning us and say, okay, poison us half as much and we're okay. No. We're not saying, we can't meet, talk to racists and say, okay, be a little less racist and we're good with it. We're not. We have to win. We have to tell the truth and win. And that is what I am going to do, is we are going to do grassroots work.
turn out in gigantic size and win across the board because that's actually what we have to do if any of this is going to change. Uh, my name is, I happen to think the U.S. Constitution looks pretty good the way it is. Yeah. So, I start with the assumption that we have a broken government. And so, if you think about, the example I always use is background checks on gun purchases. Almost everyone in the United States, Republicans, Democrats, and Independents, wants mandatory background checks on gun purchases over 90% for more than 20 years. More than 70% of NRA members want background checks on gun purchases. And we don't have it. Because actually the people who run the NRA are the gun manufacturers, and the last, they want to sell guns. And you know what, if they're background checks on gun purchases, that sort of opens the door to sensible gun policy, so they never want to let anything happen. So we don't. You know, that you can't even get this brought up in the Senate of the United States. So I'm starting with the assumption we have a broken government. And the reason that I want a national referendum is, I trust, I know people worry that we'll pass things that won't be good. And I say, okay, I actually trust the American people. I've worked on a lot of propositions. And in my mind, most people won't vote for a proposition in general unless they really want it. And it turns out, I ask myself, who do I trust? The people in DC, where we have a completely broken government that's serving corporations, or the people of the United States? And actually, I trust the people of the United States. And that's my experience, is that not only do propositions make things happen that the Congress won't let happen, they also scare the Congress into doing things for fear that we'll do a proposition. And so I know that sometimes people make mistakes too. I'm not saying this is perfect. But what I know is if we make a mistake, we can undo it. That it's not perpetual. That when, oh, we've made some Lulus. But we get to go undo them. And people understand it, and they're willing to change, and it actually works. So I actually believe we can do this system more democratically that will get better answers. I really believe in the broadest possible participation. I mean, I am a grassroots person. I started one of the biggest grassroots organizations in the United States, Next Gen. We did the biggest youth voter mobilization in American history in 2018. And with our partners in the labor movement through an organization called For Our Future, we've knocked on over 25 million doors over 500,000 doors in Nevada in 2018. I believe in true democracy and true participation across the board. And so Tom, I actually think, I know it won't be perfect, but I believe it's a system that actually will reinvigorate the democracy and get it going because we have a broken government. And so <laughs> hopping over that hurdle is not hard. We have a very low hurdle, and I believe the people of the United States, and this is my experience, actually this gets them involved, and people may say, oh, the ballot's so complicated and difficult, and people spend a lot of time on it and do a great job. I want to make sure we get a chance for Heidi to ask a question at some point, because she's sitting there. And she's going to ask it no matter what we do.